Good afternoon and welcome to uh, New Directors. Uh, my name is Gavin Smith. I'm one of the uh, members of the selection committee for New Directors. And uh, I'm very happy to be uh, here with you to introduce The Emperor Visits the Hell. Um, I'm going to try and uh, say a few words about it uh, and then uh, the director who's here will hopefully say a few more words to clarify the uh, mistakes I'll probably make in describing what you're about to see. Um, this is a, I guess, a modern day um, adaptation of three chapters from one of the classic uh, um, works of literature of um, 16th century China. Uh, a, an epic 100 chapter book called um, Journey to the West. Um, this just deals with three chapters, um, so it's just a little piece of it. Um, Journey to the West is uh, um, a, 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 a book that in recent years has, there's been a tremendous upsurge of interest in it in China and, and many filmmakers have, uh, have, have, have made adaptations of parts of the uh, the whole, and I guess in some cases the whole, including um, um, Stephen Chow, who has who made a film about ten years ago, and has recent and and I think this year has done another adapt adaptation, which reportedly is the um, the um, all time box office hit in China. Um, Donnie Yen, who was with us last year for the New York Asian Film Festival, has also um, done a film um, which I'm not sure if it's been released yet in in China. Uh, in which uh, called the Monkey King, in which Donnie Yen plays the Monkey King, uh, the Monkey King being an important uh, character in Journey to the West. Um, so, the thing about this adaptation of Journey to the West is it's probably rather lower budget than all of the others. Um, it's set in the modern day, and uh, I think that one of the things that that it really sets out to do is take something that's legendary and grand and epic and set it in a very mundane, very kind of day-to-day -day kind of environment. And legendary characters such as um, Dragon King and um, Heaven's Executioner uh, are transposed into people who are bureaucrats or perhaps gangsters, shady people with shady pasts. And so it's a, uh, it's a very kind of uh, a strange experience. And I think for those of you who, who uh, are familiar with, with uh, the original book, um, you're probably gonna get more of the jokes than, than those that aren't, uh, including me. I'm no expert on, uh, on Journeys to the West or Chinese literature, but uh, I can tell you that Wikipedia is incredibly helpful when you're preparing for an introduction. Um, I'm now going to uh, invite the director, uh, Li Lu, to come up and uh, correct me and perhaps give you a few more details that will help. Um, uh, please welcome Li Lu. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much um, for coming to watch the film. Um, I just want to thank, first, want to thank uh, MoMA and the uh, Lincoln. Film Society of Lincoln Center for uh, selecting this film and uh, giving me this opportunity to uh, to show this film in New York, in in U.S. as well. The, this is the U.S. premiere in US, uh, of the film. Um, uh, I actually, I like everything you said about about the film. It's uh, yeah, it's uh, just a lot of uh, background um, stories um, about this. Film it was based on the classic novel, which I highly recommend it. And um, and uh, there's many adaptations, the TV dramas, the films, especially Stephen Chow's film, and that was made in in the 90s. It was a uh, very uh, it was a classic Chinese Hong Kong comedy comedy film. And uh, what else? And uh, yeah, I also recommend history books, Wikipedia, and if you'd like to seek more information about the story, about the history. Um, my film is a bit um, different from all the other adaptations, because I, mostly because I have very low budget. I couldn't make all this fantastic world in the film, but uh, I tried to uh, tell the story in a, a different and still interesting way. I'm hoping you can still enjoy it. Um, so we can talk more about, the, about it afterwards. Thank you very much. Perhaps the, the, 
the best way to start out is for you to tell us what led you to to take on this project, what inspired you to 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 tackle this, and, and what in particular about these three chapters attracted you? Mm, okay, I happen to read this uh, three chapters from this uh, from this novel. Uh, the novel is very very well known and. Uh, and it's about, uh, as we all know, uh, as I have said, it's about the Monkey King. But these three chapters, they're kind of like independent little bit on its own from the book. And uh, also I did more research. And there were actually different versions of the, this particular story um, in these three chapters already kind of uh, circulated before the novel was written. So I don't know since when this kind of folklore or legend already kind of uh, uh, the story has been told for many years. The novel was uh, written in the 16th century, so probably already started like long time before that. And uh, I found it very interesting is that I found it still very relevant in terms in terms of uh, to you know in order to understand the current Chinese society. Um, because the, uh, and we can see this link between the traditional Chinese society and the current Chinese society in terms of the power structure, how this uh, bureaucracy, how it works and everything, different kind of uh, parties in the society, how they interact with each other, and I found that still very revealing and uh, relevant. That's why I, I started to, um, that's to the starting point, making this project. And, uh, and then I decided just to uh, keep the original characters, their names still the same, um, but change their kind of identities, but still just present it as uh, realistic as, as possible as in the present society. So in, in the, the modern version, um, the um, uh, Dragon King is a gangster. Um, um, the emperor, Li Shemin, is some kind of official um, and, but then when we go into the underworld, the figures there, um, the, the king of hell and the, um, I forget the, the name of the, the person who's his guardian there, the, um, do they represent to you, uh, I mean, the, the king of hell seems like another gangster to me, but is he intended to be, uh, representative of another kind of, um, uh, area of power in contemporary China? Yes, um, I mean, I guess some of the characters, their identity is not that clear. You can't really exactly find a counterpoint, counterpart in the current society. Uh, you can guess, you can make guess, like say, Dragon King is more like a gangster, and uh, the, the main emperor is more like an uh, official. Uh, King of Hell, to me, he's more like some sort of, a, um, in the more city area, it's kind of the guys who's in charge of that, who's probably a little bit in between, like, which which is kind of common. Like, say, if you go to a like more rural area, more kind of a, um, outskirt of city area, you may find some sort of official. They are not that different from a like, gangster, and uh, so in a way. I mean, it's not very clear. Like, uh, there's a little ambiguous, ambigu ambiguity to it. Isn't that kind of intentional? I mean, in a sense, what you've done is you've 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 given us a, a a critique or a criticism of contemporary China, but you've disguised it using one of the most traditional narratives um, from Chinese culture. Is that is is that a way? F is that a way around questions, perhaps, of censorship or or or, or, or just getting in trouble? Um, I don't know. I, I I don't know. I wasn't really concerned with that because this film is uh, totally independent. I I didn't get the permit to shoot it or to, I don't really intend to release it. Got it released in China and so I didn't deal with any authority. So I'm not really worried about what they think about the film. Um, about the disguising part, to me is not as important as this way to to uh, have this plan to totally blend the history and the and the present together, and same thing with heaven, hell, and the and the living world together. So I just have the I just want to create this kind of world that seems like 
they're all together, like the same. Well, in a sense, the fact that the underworld, the fact that the hell that the emperor visits is not really that different from the, the, yeah. the, the, the world that he comes from is itself some kind of a comment. I mean, I don't know, or, or, um, maybe I don't, uh, uh, the Western conception of hell is uh, some place that's very different and that's full of misery and, 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 and you know, devils. Um, maybe the, the, the Asian or Chinese conception of hell is a little different. If so, perhaps you could tell us. Yeah, that's actually a good point. It is it's a little bit different if you compare the concept of uh, hell and heaven in the West, in the West, especially in Christianity. And I think it's more clear, right? In, in a way, heaven and, and hell. Hell is full of misery. Heaven is so heaven is so happy, happy place. And but uh, in the Chinese culture, um, it's a little bit blurry the boundaries between them. And heaven is not definitely is not depicted as something that like happy place. It's more just like a, another kind of bureaucratic system up there. It, <laughs> if you look, yeah, it's true. They have all sorts of uh, like different kind of ranks of uh, officials up there. And so same with hell, and uh, but hell is definitely more more mis miserable place than heaven. Um, but still, same thing. They have all different kind of ranks of offic officials in hell as well. And to me, I think that uh, the uh, the idea of hell and heaven in Chinese Chinese culture probably originated more from the obse observations of reality, the, the the world we live in. Like you probably see some part of the reality that's very full of misery and you and then you somehow you know you come up with this kind of idea of how you know some people live in that kind of world so and i i i try to push it bit further in this film is that they all kind of together the same and uh, um but of course it's not the um, i think the chinese concept of uh, hell and heaven also uh, had influence from other cultures as well, from Buddhism, from India, probably even from the West. So it's not as just uh, simplistic as what I just said. That's a the complex part. The other thing I wanted to ask you about before I take questions from the audience is the sort of playful um, approach to narrative. There seem to be a number of different ways in which the story is told. I mean, primarily it's told through the action, but then there's also the introduction uh, of the, the comic book which takes over and, and fills in some of the narrative. And then there are also moments where uh, subtitles uh, carry the narrative forwards. And then there are also moments where two characters talking basically narrate something that, that's happened uh, instead of you showing it happening. So I'm curious about this kind of way in which you intermix those ingredients. And was that something that came about um, gradually, or was it something that, that was part of your original conception, particularly the comic book? Uh, originally, I had the idea of comic book. Actually, I need to explain more about the comic book. Comic book in in back in the sixties, seventies, and eighties, that kind of picture book are very popular in China. They are just uh, based on films, but probably back then people didn't have that much access to movie theaters, so there's this need to watch films in the kind of, uh, uh, in book format. So they uh, pick frames from the film and then, and then give text. So you can read the story, and you can also somehow get the idea, the visual aspect of the film. They were very popular, and uh, I read a lot when I was, when I was a kid. And, and I found them still very interesting, as, just as its own kind of uh, 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 form. To me, it's kind of like art form in a way because it's also very cinematic, but it's not an actual film. So I wanted to somehow incorporate that in this film, especially because this film has uh, some actions, dramatic actions, some things happening, and I found that it's very interesting to see that on the little book. Also kind of suggest kind of uh, uh, this little bit link with history. And... Um, uh, about the other things you said, uh, using text, using book, and 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 just characters yeah. having a conversation about something. Yeah, I, I I do intend to. Originally, I actually intended to have a, a main narrator 
that's supposed to be the fortune teller, actually. Occasionally, we'll hear his voice uh, explaining what's happening, because he seems to be the guy who knows everything, kind of. And, uh, but at the end, I did, I did record all the narration, but at the end, I decided not to do that. I just wanted to use text. Um, and uh, I do want to actually um, explore this relationship between sometimes the text and then the image. And also, I remember even uh, in Bresson's film, Country, Diary of Country Priest, sometimes the narration explains the things what we're going to see. Sometimes the narration describes the things we just seen. So I've, I found it very fascinating that this relationship between how you can use text combined with image to create some uh, kind of uh, use, a, use it as a narrative device, very effective, um, but then not like using all the time probably, you just to find a kind of a, a balance of it. Okay, questions out there, yes. Uh, the question was about the choice of the Henry Purcell music for the, I guess, second shot in the film, practically, or, or one of the, the, the second scene in the film of the long nighttime car journey. Yeah, I, I filmed that part first, and when I was filming it, just because I was very impressed, I really liked that part of uh, driving uh, around, the, around the lake at night. I filmed that part first, but I didn't know how to really use that until later on when I was watching the footage, I came up, I remember this uh, Henry Purcell's music and uh, was actually was, uh, the performer was uh, um, uh, Nomi, right, Klaus, Klaus Nomi, the, who was kind of a legendary figure in the 70s, 80s. And I think his rendition also created this, it's kind of like a modern rendition of that uh, traditional opera. Um, which to me also kind of, um, I think his rendition suggests some kind of really chilling kind of effect of that music. And the music is actually also called the, the, the cold, cold song, right? The cold song is also describing this person kind of going to the underworld and the, you know, going to the, be dead and all this stuff. And I found that it's very kind of relevant. And also just the feeling of it, I found that it's very interesting, has kind of very strong impact. And so I just decided to use that. Yes. Yes, question, the question was about the, the introduction of kind of more documentary elements in the film, specifically the images of the flooded city, uh, and also, I guess, the penultimate scene of the, the conversation in the restaurant where uh, the, the actor playing Li Shemin is himself, and, and we even glimpse you um, in, in, in the corner of the frame at one point. Um, about the archival footage, that was, uh, yeah, that's just something I, I, want, I need, needed to use. What happened is actually during our shooting that summer, uh, there was there were quite a few rain, big rain, heavy rainfalls in my in my city, and then there was flooding afterwards. And it seems to happen more often now in China than before. Probably has to do with a lot of the rapid development development of uh, cities, but uh, without actually the um, the certain uh, structure to support it, and then so it caused all these problems. And, and I, I wanted to use that, and uh, the footage is very, because it's very real, and, and it's, uh, it's about the present and what's happening, and, and, and I thought it could somehow go into the story. The, in the original story, I don't think there was a describing of flooding or, or rainfalls. I just somehow created that. I put it in, in this film. And about the, the last part, uh, that part is just simply because I, throughout the shooting, it was the first time I worked with this actor, and he's not a professional actor. Actually, none of them is professional actor. Uh, and then, so throughout shooting, I, I started to know him better, and I found that he, him as a person, just in real life, is really fascinating. I, 
Um, but somehow, for my film, I wanted to uh, go through this very kind of, uh, very controlled kind of uh, acting style, and then I found that it's kind of limiting to him. He wasn't really happy with that, and I wanted to give him a chance just to be himself, and want to film him just as, you know, and, and that's why I, I, I did for the last part. But also I wanted to suggest this might be just, this could be kind of another side of the character. Like I don't see him as a, just to purely as the actor. I still see him sometimes as the, uh, still as the emperor. You know, we still call him the emperor as his nickname. And um, so this could be another side of the emperor we probably don't see. We probably don't see in the official kind of uh, version. And um, so that's why I did, it, did that part. And me being it, it's not really intended. Just somehow the, the cameraman put me in there, yeah. But he specifically mentions you and being in Canada, and he mentions that the, the cameraman is from, I guess, Nepal? No, no, he, yeah. The, the guy sitting beside him is another actor who actually who was in the film, who was the guy who was going to give the money to the old couple. He's not from Nepal. He's just totally making it up. He was drunk, so he. But yeah, he does he seem look, pretty drunk. But he does look like from somebody from Nepal. So that was. So yeah, he was pretty smart in the way when he's drunk. Yes. Um, sorry, you you mean the question is? Uh, Will there be any repercussions if this film does come to the attention of any officials in China? Um, might be. I mean, when I when I said I don't intend to uh, show this film in China, I don't mean not show it at all. Uh, it actually has been screened once in a sort of small festival. I mean, for that kind of events, I think I can show it. But I don't intend to have a, like a real uh, theatrical release, and I don't think that's possible. You have to get all this permit and all this stuff. And for authorities, for officials, I don't know. Yeah, they might have some. I I don't know. I so far I haven't heard of from anybody who's like that that, that position who has seen the film. I, I guess they might probably feel something, and uh, it's hard to say. Um, yeah, I guess maybe, yeah, from, I, I, I'll make a guess. That, but the story and the way I probably tell the story might be a little bit confusing to them. So I don't know if they will actually follow it, <laughs> really. It's well, you, you said to me the other night that um, this story is a, is a treasured, revered story in, in China and that you thought that the, some people would actually find your treatment of it, your, uh, the irreverence of, of how you treat it would, would upset them a bit. You mentioned that your dad probably wouldn't like the film. My dad actually would be okay with it, actually. I, I don't know. Um, the story actually itself, I don't know. The story itself, I think, it was a little bit satiric already, but it wasn't as obvious as probably what I did in the film. I think back then, there's all this kind of um, legends, folklore, or local opera, for ordinary people, they probably they come up with the idea or they or it's made for them. They can somehow use them as a way to express their their feelings or their concerns or about those uh, uh, officials. So that's already different from official history, because in official history, this this emperor is considered one of the best, one of the wisest, one of the, the one of the greatest emperors ever in Chinese history. Um, but you know the, the fact that this story already started a long time ago, I can sort of make a guess that back then already people, ordinary people already kind of uh, expressed their own kind of opinions about this emperor in this kind of subtle way, in this kind of uh, uh, fantastical story. You uh, mean sort of their dissent with, with yeah, the official history? Yeah, you know, put the emperor go go through this process is already kind of uh, in a way it's already is not that reverent already, and uh, probably I did a bit more than what what they try to do it in the original story, and well, so I guess for people who are actually very concerned about how China is being seen in the world, how this image of China, Chinese culture, Chinese history, 
and they, if they consider this emperor very important, and they probably think that I'm not doing a very good job portraying him this way. I mean, but I'm not really concerned with that. But I got a feeling that I might react that way. Any more questions? Yes. Where did I film it? It was all filmed in the city where I grew up in, in Wuhan, China. Yep, thank you. Any last questions? Uh, yeah. Right. Oh. Yeah. Uh, the question was about the um, the calligrapher who's writing on newspaper in in the in the plaza, and uh, um, um, Li Shimin picks up the newspaper and he's reading something, and it seems to upset him. He he balls the paper up and throws it away. Could you do uh, the the actual text wasn't translated? Right. Maybe that part is not very clear. That was the Dragon King. The guy was writing. He had a kind of a new haircut, so probably that wasn't very recognizable. But it was him, so he's the one now who's writing those things to pass out to people, and he's just very angry. Maybe he's also a little bit too upset to, you know, that's probably, he couldn't really find other ways to express his anger, but, you know, he can only do this. So he's writing something just very, He's saying, you know, blaming Li Ximin for all the things, bad things he has done, kind of things. And of course, Li Ximin is upset seeing that I just throw it away. In the old days, probably now it's rare, but in the old days, some Chinese people, ordinary, especially from like a more uh, lower part of society, they they will write things on on the paper, uh, and then they will list down all the unfair things, or they want to look for justice. They will for kind of a suitcase or, you know, they'll write down this way. And so that's what, what Dragon King is doing similarly to that. Yes. Yes, a question about the use of different dialects in the film, and, and um, tell us more about that. Yeah, mostly they speak the dialect in the city. In China, you know, different cities, every city, every province have their own dialect, and then most of the actors I, in this film, they're, they're from the city, so they speak their, their own dialect. And it's just more natural for them, and, uh, and also I did try to, um, and in this film, try to do something like um, those local operas doing. Local operas, they all do in their own way, uh, speak their own dialect and, um, in different regions in China. And it's a more, it's just a, 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 a very kind of a, a local kind of form. They more, they don't really intend to show, perform for people from outside region, but I think it could be still understood for people by the people from outside region. It's just more, uh, I think it's more authentic in a way. So that's why I, I just kept it that way. Thanks. Okay, we seem to be out of questions out there. Um, I have just one last thing, and, and that is about the, the Li Shemin is a real historical figure. Yes. And um, this interlude in his life where he, <laughs> he visits hell for a little while and then comes back, does that correspond to any actual historical event? Was he very ill and, and then recovered? Uh, I'm curious as to how that th this narrative is inserted into what is basically you know a, a, an actual historical character's life. No, I don't think it was. There was any actual thing in history that corresponded to this uh, to this event. But uh, but uh, in the original story. They they did mention that when he went to hell, he he came across his uh, his brothers and the father, the brothers he killed, and uh, so that was a big thing in terms for this guy. If you look look at look at this guy, and uh, and yeah, and actually just another sort of thing maybe we can add to that is that 
Later on, his own family, his own sons, had problems. When he was older, when they had to somehow compete with each other for the to become the successor. So his own. So I don't know if you can probably say that he didn't set up a good example for his uh, for his children. I think he suffered from that. Okay, uh, Li Liu, thanks very much. Thanks, everyone.